Hi, I'm Tamara Thomas with Urban Health Weekly, and we're doing something a little different this week. I decided to reach out to my friend who is a former, recently retired patient advocate for one of Brooklyn's largest healthcare systems. And I decided to reach out to him because I recently read about some developments with, um, with uh, transvaginal um, ultrasounds. And then after talking to another friend of mine about a situation that she had where a doctor just didn't listen to her complaints, I figured, you know, it's time that people took matters into their hands more. And what better way to start than with a patient advocate like yourself. So just tell people, tell people, you know, just give a brief overview of what you do. And, and what you are to a patient. So the role of a patient advocate is really the role representing, speaking for and on behalf of the silent ones. Those who are sometimes mortally afraid to speak to the providers, or at times they are maybe because of their financial situations or lack of insurance, sometimes they, they do not know how to breach the, the lack of care. And so they solicit the, the aid of a patient advocate to help them uh, with the process. And in so doing, you educate them as to how they can acquire care. Some patients are also, they may feel indifferent as to what the doctor is suggesting. And because two of their maybe immigrant status uh, or how they're gonna pay the bill, they are afraid. They're afraid to ask questions. They're afraid to come and receive treatment. And so we are like the sounding board. We are like the bridge. Uh, we stand in the gap for those patients to facilitate and to, to see how best we can bridge that gap for care. So how do you, so how do patients, how, how do patients encounter you? Like what's the first, how, is, it, is it through a complaint first or do they ask or, or when you get into the, the hospital or the emergency room or the clinic, do they tell you up front when they give you the patient bill of rights? How, do, how, how, does, how does a patient find out about someone like yourself? Uh, every patient who, uh, is admitted generally or enter a facility in the state of New York should receive a copy of the patient bill of rights. That, that booklet or that print out, because every facility have a different way of presenting it, mm -hmm. must have accompanied with it uh, the locality of the department, other representatives and a contact number. Mm, that's so right. that it's incumbent upon every facility, healthcare facility, to provide every patient with this information. There are some facilities that camouflage or try to get them to the AOD or administrator on duty or some supervisor and um, somewhat hide the fact that patient relations exist because um, it is and should operate as an independent office, although oftentimes there uh, are advocates are pressured to be silent. And, and that could be dangerous. Why that, yeah, why is something like that happening? Why would they silence, why would a patient be silenced? One, one has to understand that the patient advocate is a voice and it's the voice of the patient. Right. And he or she knows the underhand dealings. He, know, he or she knows the inside out of the operation of the facility that he or she works. Right. And um, because of that, it makes it easier for the advocate uh -huh. to go to the powers that be to get things done. Oftentimes they are disliked. And again, oftentimes they're liked because they make the, the transition smooth. Okay. Or smoother, yeah. So, if I'm a patient visiting the clinic or the hospital, who tells me about you? Like I understand, I because I for example, I always get a patient 
bill of rights. It's part of like the packet when you're filling out and you're signing out stuff. But no one has ever said to me, and by the way, you know, uh, if you have any issues, they're quick to send you a, a survey, let's say, but no one ever, and I don't know if, if, if that's even something that comes from your department also, like when you get these surveys, how was our service? But no one ever says, and if you have an issue, we do have a patient um, advocate or patient guest relations office that you can refer to. So if you're not an informed, if you're not an informed patient, how do, how does one find out? Or larger, if you're in the community and you're afraid to, to, to have care because your status or you're afraid, well, I don't have the money. Like I just saw this uh, incredible clip of this woman who her leg went down in the, the in between the train and the track and the, 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 the platform. Yeah. And everyone is trying to rock the train to try to free her leg. And she keeps screaming, don't call the ambulance. It costs too much money. Don't call the ambulance at $3,000. So she's more concerned about the bill she's going to get. She doesn't want to go to the hospital. She's more concerned about the bill she's going to get and maybe the care she's going to get at the hospital than the fact that her leg is trapped between the train and the... So how, does, how, does, how do you bridge the gap? How do, how do patients get in contact with you? How do they find out that you even exist? Now, every, every healthcare facility should have a patient advocate. Mm -hmm. um, they are under different titles, ombudsman, okay. advocate, patient representative, mm -hmm. all doing the same work. However, sometimes there are places that assign the function to social workers. Oh. Who, with due respect to social workers, uh, their, their slant of advocacy could be a little different because their function, basically, their training is for social work. And uh, the oftentimes, too, you find cases like that woman who got hurt by the train shouting, don't call the ambulance, although her, her life depends on it. Um, if you do check back with her background, she's an undocumented resident. Mm. And, uh, cannot afford the healthcare insurance, cannot afford the healthcare insurance, mm -hmm. cannot afford to pay the bill. Mm -hmm. And hence you find a, a lot of the city facilities, um, New York City that is, mm -hmm. do have some programs where they can be accommodated. Uh -huh. But within the bill of rights itself, mm -hmm. no one should be refused care regardless of their ability to pay. However, they would go to a facility and they would be just given the mere minimum of care and um, close to be um, discharged inappropriately. Mm -hmm. They may not have medication. They may not have the equipment to, to hop around with, like a, a pair of crutches, if it's a fractured um, limb, you know? And uh, so it's difficult because the patient need care, yes, and the hospital is looking after their own financial interests. Mm -hmm. And say that to say also that oftentimes healthcare is not so much about healthcare, but about, but about finances. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that is sad, but I mean, it's, 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 you it's you a reality. The, you, you come in to bridge the gap. Yes. By, by pointing them to like services and um, ways. Definitely. So when, when, you, when you hear that a patient comes to you, oftentimes they'll tell you a friend told them mm -hmm. or an employee will oh, tell okay. them. Um, mm -hmm. Not many employees. Uh, em uh, some employees will put a, um, call a supervisor or manager for you, but the managers know that they must inform patients of the Department of Patient Guest Relations, Patient Relations. Mm -hmm. And that is very important. So. Oftentimes, too, advocates walk the floors and walk in areas to let people know who they are and why they exist. So meeting them and greeting them is a form also of educating them where they are and how they are available or accessible. That's good. Okay. Um, so give me an example. You, you gave me some examples. Give me an example. You gave me some examples of um, some care disparities. So like, for example, the sickle cell patient being labeled a drug seeker. 
Uh, how do you address that in your role? Like what, what, so, so I'm, I'm having pain because I'm having a, a, an episode, you know, with my sickle cell, I've run out of my medication or I don't have regular medication and I'm in agony because that's a very painful, debilitating um, condition. Uh, I go to the emergency room because I need some pain relief and I'm just waiting around, even though I can prove that I have sickle cell or they may have done the blood test already. And clearly I have the sickle cell. Um, they're kind of putting me aside and making me wait because they're concerned about drug seeking. So how do you so go? How do you? You see, it, it, it is a sad thing to, to know uh, that or to even consider how sickle cell patients have been treated before how they are being treated. There was a whole New York Times originally, thing that, by the way. There was a whole right? New York Times thing following this one woman with sickle cell, uh, you know, with that same situation where she, her doctors kept dropping her because they said that she wasn't following the protocol and she was telling them she was in all this great pain and they, not that they were downplaying it, but they were concerned because of you know all the opioid this and opioid that. Yeah. They didn't want to give her more medication than was recommended, and it was the medication was not sufficient for her pain. It was a whole big thing on that. So I just thought that was an interesting example. That yeah, yes, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I'm not a clinician, but I, I have been in this business long enough to know that if the communities that serve the sickle cell patients had initially done the protocol of treating the patients as they should, even if and when the patient would have become dependent on, let's say, narcotics for their pain, it would have taken a much longer time to get there if the proper protocol was done and or implemented as a plan of care. However, um, from my observation, they did not do what they should have done by um, the correct, what I would consider the correct treatment or plan of care. So subsequently, the patient with the treatment that was given to them became um, less tolerant of the drug. And so it means that the body demands more of this medication. Right. And when they present themselves to the facilities at the clinics and uh, in the emergency room, mind you, if they go to the, the, the regular doctor who controls the pain management, who controls the medication, their treatment will be much different because the, the pain manager for that patient will be better be able to narrow in and find out uh, to see if that patient is drug seeking or if that patient is in pain, that particular patient in question. There are different disparities, as you would know. Yeah. Uh, a patient comes in because he belongs to a certain group and he's intoxicated, will be given a different form of treatment versus another patient who don't belong to that group. We're gonna, you, you jumped uh, the table, we're gonna get to that, go ahead. You know, and um, there you go, bingo a patient is given the correct protocol of care for that um, drunkenness versus another group, mm -hmm. you know? And it is like that because people, professionals are not fair to themselves. Because mm -hmm. if you are a healthcare professional, just as, if it's, it, just as in the police department, if you see another police officer is doing wrong, all the police are not bad. But if a, a police is doing wrong and you're a good officer, you will correct that officer for doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Likewise, in the healthcare profession, although it's a little different because a provider, a clinician is licensed to practice medicine. And so it is not really right unless that provider asks you for a, a suggestion mm. how to treat his or her patient. It sounds like the doctor's, the doctor's opinion trumps expediency. It's like, well, what I say goes and I'm the licensed one here and my butt is on the line. So yeah, about well, well, it's very much like that. It, it's very much like that. Uh, the, I, the, the attending called the shot uh -huh. and that is what is, they go by. Mm. 
And that's what they, they go by. And um, who's the question? Because even after that is done, um, where is the regulatory process or the reviewing process for, uh, let's say, a rank or two above, go on a daily basis to review charts to see what level of care, what plan of care was given, how was this patient treated versus that patient mm -hmm. to be able to be standardized across the board. Right, 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 right. Unless there is, unless there is some um, clinical reason or, um, or patient with some other condition mm -hmm. that will not cause this provider to treat this patient with this form or measure of care, mm -hmm. right? So there we go. Now, if you have a patient who is not getting circulation in his uh, her toes, and there's a particular procedure to save the toe, and you try that, and you can save the toe, fine. But you do that for one, and you say, oh, no circulation in two, and just have an amputation. Hmm. So now we're talking about disparities in care. We're talking about, you know. Yes, th th this, this is part of the whole process. Right. But so, then the clinician is the clinician. And um, so, so you gave the example. So going back to what you were talking about, you know, the one intoxicated patient being given IV fluid while the other one uh, is it's left to, to get sober to Linux, yeah. do whenever he or she can. So then, right. So then, so then, what do you do? Like what? So then, what? So then, how do you, as the patient advocate, step in? So you find out. Well, I, I, I have had times and occasions when I um I would have observed, mm -hmm. and then I will go to the primary nurse and find out well what's happening to this patient, and um, we also have access to review charts. So you can go review the chart and uh, see what was, how the patient is being treated. And um, you, you can never, an advocate could never tell a provider how to treat a patient, mm. but you could show the disparity of care. Mm. You could also inform them uh, that you don't think, you, you cannot say no, or you will not say no because you're not a clinician again. You do not think that that method of treatment or that attitude is appropriate or correct. Mm. With that being said, you go to the provider, the supervisor, who are or not generally the administrators, clinical administrators, mm -hmm. and you go from the time you go to an, a clinical administrator, they know you mean business, and they will either take the case over or instruct their uh, provider to change uh, to to follow uh, this plan or change the patient to another provider. Mm. Because again, they cannot they cannot direct the doctor to treat the patient the way they want. Not mm -hmm. even a judge can. Right. A judge could direct. Okay, a patient a patient may be refusing care. The judge will say, okay, I am sentencing you to the facility. I my judgment is the doctors will treat you. Mm. And the doctor the, the judge will say, do whatever you think is necessary, you deem fit or proper. But he cannot say, do not do this and do not do that. Mm -hmm. The judge will just say treat. Mm. You know? But it, but it's still up to the clinician if they, they're treating the person. So then so then other than going to the supervisor, then it doesn't other than going to the supervisor, then it really is at the clinician level to it rests on the clinician's lab because the clinician holds the light. Clinician holds the license. And as they will let you know, I have to protect my license, whatever that is. Right. So it sounds like a little bit of a pickle then, because- At time, no, no, but any time- uh, But if they say, screw you, I'm, this, is, this is what I think. I think patient A deserves the IV fluid, but patient B should just sleep it off. Yeah. Then there's really nothing you could do because- But generally, any time an advocate is involved, the, um, the, the approach and the care generally changes mm -hmm. to, the, to the level that it should always have been mm -hmm. or to some um, respectful continuation of care. Mm -hmm. And there are other alternatives like um, when it is far gone, sometimes you let the patient know that they, they can call the state 
and um, no, no provider really won the state in their business. No facility won the state in their business. Right, 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 right. Um, but we have to be fair, and um, we are obliged to give uh, the patient the information of the possibility of they call it the state or joint commission, which mm -hmm. is the accrediting company or commission agency for the healthcare facility in question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say I am a pregnant woman and I'm concerned that the obstetrician that I'm seeing, he or she is saying things to me that I feel like are not in line with my values um, or I feel like they're not taking any of my concerns seriously. So then somebody says, so I go to the patient advocate. I say, look, I'm, you know, I don't feel like Dr. So-and-so really uh, is exhibiting my best interest. What do you do? Well, anytime a, a patient feels that they're not comfortable with a provider of care, they can request to change that provider. Uh, there might be an um, there might be an obstacle. If it is a primary doctor, because in, in this time of managed care, your managed care uh, agency, uh, your insurance managed care agency would normally first have to reassign you to a different doctor as a primary care provider. Mm. But when you are seeing a specialist um, uh, like uh, a GYN or OB, uh, you can change those without going to to the um, your your insurance because the only rec doctor of record is your primary doctor PCP right All right that's a doctor of record and so um, but a gynecologist is a specialist so it's a specialist so you can go to any specialist so I often tell patients you can make a request you have two choices you can make a request to change that doctor in the facility, or you could go to another facility or another, um, if it's on an outpatient basis, another provider outside of the, the care that uh, person that you are seeing currently. So you would even direct them away from the from your facility, you say? Generally, generally no. Uh, but if they feel that they are that they are being not treated right the way that they should, and they're not comfortable for the patient's best interest. Yes, I would. If the, if there wasn't another provider uh, in that same department that you felt would best meet their needs. Yeah, you see, uh, the patient advocate must be true and fair to the patient at all times. Mm -hmm. You have a commitment to the facility, yes. But remember, you are independent, mm -hmm. being paid by the facility, but you are an independent factor. Right. Okay. So when a patient is saying that sometimes too, you have to find out from them why they feel this doctor is not the best doctor. Is it attitude? Is it the way they're communicating to you? Because sometimes you can't bridge a gap. Yeah. It might be the doctor <laughs> might be from a culture yeah. where the way they speak to women is either here or there. Yeah. Or, you know, like we have patients she might be pregnant, but um, and she may have to do a C-section, but she, uh, and, um, she might be a Jehovah Witness. Uh -huh. She don't want to receive blood. Yeah. Uh, then um, you might have a doctor who specializes in that field of dealing with um, cesarean sections without doing any blood transfusions. No. Or they may use another product that's not blood product, you know. Um, or as, as we are there, you'll find that um, a doctor, a, 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 a obstetric doctor uh, will say to the patient, you know, I think you should have an abortion. No, um, and it may not be a clinical reason, but he did not know that he's speaking to a Catholic. Right, and right. the Catholic patient is offended, right, 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 because she does not believe in that con concept. She does not support an abortion. 
Mm. So, you know, I, I things like this will happen all the time. Got so it. you have to get, have the patient to a place mm -hmm. where they are comfortable. Right. Well, and you as the advocate cannot, there. you yes. as the advocate also cannot infuse your views, religious or other, otherwise onto the patient. Right. You know, so like, that's why there are, that's why there are, there is a, a unit that is connected in most instances to patient relations or to the humanities department, they call medical ethics. So. D, let me ask you a question. Do you find that, that or did you find, because you are retired, did you find in that role that, that the healthcare providers appreciated you or was it one of those things like, oh, here he comes again. Oh, here this guy goes. Oh. Well, in my case, I've always been beastly. You know, I, I, I am a respecter of none. I don't respect titles. And because I don't respect titles, uh, I have nothing to be afraid of. I respect individuals. Mm -hmm. So you could be the CEO, CFO, AEO, whatever O, I am not afraid of you or your titles. I respect you as an individual. I'm not, I'm not going to approach you with fear, oh, because this is a CAO. No, I am approaching you first and foremost as an individual, secondly, as a co-professional. When we get out of the way, then I approach you with my concern for and on behalf of the patient. So initially, initially um, you will find some people, or some doctors, nurses, uh, they may be a little scared, for want of a better word, of the Gordon, mm -hmm. um, but they, yeah. right, or take mm -hmm. the defensive posture. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes their friend will say, he's always fair, he's always truth, truthful, and you can learn from him. So oftentimes um, the situation of people disliking me is much depleted because of their colleagues mm. who have worked with me in the past, know of my character, know that my patient care will not be compromised, and I am not here to put their license in jeopardy, mm -hmm. but to serve the patient in fairness and sincerity. And in doing so, I will also educate you as a provider what are the right things to do. You know, like, Oh, do they, so do, are they, are they happy to see, so you're saying that initially they're not so happy to see you until they talk to you and they realize there's nothing really to be concerned about. That definitely. Okay. I like that. I like that. Talk about the first, talk about a, a time, a, a case where it was like, that made you the most proud of your profession and you helped someone and it was like so life-changing for them and you just like glowed from the experience. Well, uh, there are many of those. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of my most touching moments is when um, this patient, uh, but he was becoming very toxic because the patient had um, gangrene. I can't remember the correct terminology now. So the patient leg had to be amputated. Mm -hmm. The patient was there like in the hospital for like three months after the doctors expected that, that the, the leg be taken, the leg be amputated, should have been amputated. And um, One of the doctors came to me and said, I need your assistance. Can you help me with this patient? And I said, I'll see, what is it? And he told me the story about the patient is lying in bed and um, the patient life could be saved if the patient, even at this late stage, have an amputation. So uh, the patient happened to be from the Caribbean island. Mm -hmm. And I went to the patient and then, Knowing a little about the patient's country, I told them about some of the cult their icons and their cultural um, personnel there. And we got into a conversation. 
The patient was feeling a little sick, but I started to see a smirk on the face. A smile like, I am comfortable with this individual. And I said, but I came to you because there's an, a matter of, an urgent matter that you need to address and apparently no one told you. So then I asked, I said, did the doctors tell you what's happening with you? She said, no. I said, well, um, and I went over this story about, well, you're not in the best condition right now. You're close to death door, but I'm, I'm not the one to tell you that you're about to die because that's in the hand of God. But um, you're like my mother and I wouldn't want you to die. She said she never had a son and she felt proud of someone claiming Aww. to be, you know, her child. Aww. And the lady graciously accepted eventually and um, she had her leg like, amputated. And uh, fortunately, this lady is still alive today. Lovely. Uh, Some time ago, later on, she still came back to me and um, she wasn't able to afford uh, prosthesis and I uh, was able to get a uh, connect or facilitate getting a prosthetic piece for her or leg for her. And so that's one of the happy moments. Oh, that's a good one, man. That's a good one. Tell me about one that was uh, a great disappointment to you. Uh, it is always a disappointment when you go to administrators and they defend the staff in the wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of a political connectivity um, that their staff can do no wrong puts the patient and their colleagues in such a place mm -hmm. uh, that um, it doesn't make a good work environment. It also says that if I am to be a patient there, that is the treatment that I will receive. When you see an administrator harboring wrong, to me, that is criminal. Mm. And so individuals like that uh, cannot be respected by me. Uh, you know, regardless of who it is, People have to be respected. People have to be treated with dignity. And when someone is in the wrong, it's okay. Why is it okay for someone to be in the wrong? That's the time you take it as a learning curve to do something about the error and so it will not happen again with you and to another patient. It's as simple as that. Everything don't have to be litigious. Everything don't have to be a, a, an outrageous wrong. It could be a simple thing of you snapping at a patient when you could have really uh, spoken to the patient and said, ma'am, would you kindly go to the next seat, please, rather than, don't go there. What sense does it make? Can I tell you a story? I went to um, an emergency room. It wasn't your uh, emergency room. This was um, maybe like a couple of years ago. This was pre-COVID because Lizzie had an ear infection and it was like the middle of the night and her ear was hurting. And so I took her to the ER at one of the facilities. And our experience was fine, but I have to tell you that when a child was there with his parents, um, he was like, you know, maybe like he, he couldn't have, he, probably a tween, no younger than 10, no older than, you know, 13. Uh, yeah. And he was trying to explain to the provider that he was in pain. And the provider was badgering him like, oh, you're in pain. What kind of pain are you in? Oh yeah, you're in pain. What kind of pain? And so the kid is freezing up because he's a kid and he's not expecting to be badgered by a doctor and he's in pain. And his parents, I didn't think his parents spoke English so they were not really sure what to make of the situation. And he was just like shaking and like trying to describe for this, his hands are shaking. He's trying to describe where the pain is as best as he could because he's a kid. Yeah. And I have to tell you, Dee, I was so disgusted. I couldn't believe that, that that had happened and that no one had stepped in and said anything. I, looking back, I probably should have said something to somebody about that, but I was just so stunned 
Like I have never seen such a nasty, like a, a, such an outward display of like disdain for a patient, a child ever in my life. So I, I didn't like, I, you know, it just took me a while to like process it. But what happens in a situation like that? Yeah. No. Um, in the middle of the night, by the way, this was like two, three in the morning. It is out of that kind of attitude that mm -hmm. pediatrics receive, uh, the kind of care that pediatrics receive, that a new bill of rights was instituted for parents. So oh. there's now a parent bill of rights. And uh, it gives the parent the right to represent, the right to be present during the care, the right to an interpreter. Uh, so, you know, if a, although the patient is speaking, the patient is, up, um, is 13 or under 13, and is speaking the language, English okay. language. And his, and his parents were present, but they didn't speak English. I they did not speak. Creole. It is incumbent. I feel like they had a Creole person. Yes, it is incumbent upon the provider to, cre uh, to create the availability or to obtain assistance for some language. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when English is a second language also, remember, and the person who wants their language in the state of New York, it should be given. Let me tell you, I've seen, the patient. Where I've seen a lot of cases where patients are just sitting around waiting because there's no one who speaks Spanish or Creole or, or, or Russian. They're just sitting around waiting because they're like, they have to go to some department and find somebody who's going to come. And it's tough, especially like in an emergency room situation where a lot of these, these patients go, you know, for care because they don't have insurance. Very much so, and um, the language, if I am, if I am not mistaken, it is one of the things that the federal government will get involved very easily if you complain, because language must be available. If you are a deaf person, as I was alluding to earlier on, we should be able to provide you with an interpreter, with an interpreter because that's your form of language. That's the way you communicate. And so you must be respected and it must be provided in the state of New York. Oftentimes, um, people will just want to pull their friend and pull their neighbors. No, it must be someone who is competent to transfer medical terminology because not everyone will be equipped with that know-how of transferring medical, um, translating medical terminology. Mm -hmm. That's why it's preferred to have, um, not licensed, but certified interpreters. Mm -hmm. Do all hospitals have that? With... Do they have interpreters on staff? Uh, there are some facilities that employ uh, translators. There are some departments in the city that employ uh, interpreters. There are, however, other facilities that do not have interpreters. They have uh, agencies and um, they will book appointments or so for the deaf patient, mm -hmm. as the case may be. What? Now, other, other people do facilitate their countrymen the fellow country person with some assistance of uh, interpreting for that person or that patient. Hmm. One last question for you, Dee, and then I know you have to go. Um, so in a large healthcare system, obviously your department exists, but like, let's say I go to a, a clinical setting, would I find an equivalent department or person um, it, let's say I went to like um, an NYU Langone or a Mount Sinai or, um, you know, like these little clinics that. Yes. Would you. Brookdale, Presbyterian, all, all those. those are bigger, those are bigger centers. And so obviously. Right. The, no, what I'm saying is they all have their satellite uh, right. units outpatients there. Okay. Wherever their, those smaller units are. Right. 
Uh, generally, uh, they can speak to the manager and or ask a request for the patient relations number. Generally, they don't have a person there. They are, but you can ask for the number and um, the patient relations department will respond, you know, how they will call that department over there or the facility might be able to, pro would provide transportation for representatives to get to that site as far quickly as possible. So there are different methods for a patient advocate to communicate with a patient but, uh, who's outside of the hospital setting mm -hmm. and is part of that system. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. Listen, it's really important for, for patients, especially if you're a, like a, a, a timid person or you're not, uh, you don't feel comfortable, you feel um, overwhelmed by, you know, the whole medical thing, um, the whole medical machine. It's important that people like that know about your role and your department in the hospital because it could mean the difference between them having excellent care or no care at all. So um, I want to thank you. You're most welcome because I, I like, I, although I'm retired, I still make, make, make myself available to individuals, to people. Why? Because the education could never stop. It's a continuous education yeah. to the masses. And one less person that is informed is still one less from the community at large. You're absolutely right, my man. Absolutely right. All right. Thank you so much, Delano Gordon. You're most welcome, my dear. It's good to see you. Regards, it's good to see you too. Give my regards to Gabby and Luana and um, stay well. Uh, yeah. All the best blessings and thanks. All right. Bye.